How does the labor market affect capitalism? In many ways, the labor market is the one that affects capitalism the most. The right libertarian assumption, like that of mainstream economics, is that markets clear and therefore the labor market will also clear. As this assumption has rarely been proven to be true in actuality, i.e. periods of full employment within capitalism are, well, few and far between, this leaves its supporters with a problem. Reality contradicts the theory. The theory predicts full employment, but reality shows that this is not the case. Since we're dealing with logical deductions from assumptions, obviously the theory cannot be wrong, and so we must identify external factors which cause the business cycle and so unemployment. In this way, attention is diverted from the market and its workings. After all, it's assumed that the capitalist market works, and, well, on to something else then. This something else has been quite a few different things, most ridiculously sunspots, in the case of one of the founders of marginalist economics, William Stanley Jevons. However, these days, most pre-free market, uh, pro-free market capitalist economists and right libertarians have now decided that instead of sunspots being at fault, it's the state. In this section, I'm going to present a case that maintains that the assumption that markets clear is false for at least one reason, unique, market, namely the market for labor. As the fundamental assumption underlying free market capitalism is false, the logically consistent superstructure built upon comes crashing down. Part of the reason why capitalism is unstable is due to the commodification of labor, i.e. people, and the problems that this creates. The state itself can have positive and negative impacts on the economy, but removing it or its influence will not solve the business cycle. So why is this? Well, simply due to the nature of the labor market. Anarchists have long realized that the capitalist market is based upon inequalities and changes in power. Proudhon argued that the manufacturer says to the laborer, you are as free to go elsewhere with your services as I am to receive them. I offer you so much. The merchant says to the customer, take it or leave it. You're the master of your money as I am the goods. I want so much. Who will yield? The weaker. He, like all anarchists, saw that domination, oppression, and exploitation flow from inequalities of market economic power and that the power of invasion lies in superior strength. What is property? Page uh, 216 and, well, 215. This applies with greatest force to the labor market. While mainstream economics and right libertarian variations of it refuse to acknowledge that the capitalist market is based upon hierarchy and power, anarchists and socialists and communists and other leftists in general don't share this opinion because they don't share uh, because they do not share this understanding with anarchists right libertarians will never be able to understand capitalism or its dynamics and development thus when it comes to the labor market it's essential to remember that the balance of power within it is the key to understanding the business cycle thus the economy must be understood as a system of power so how does the labor market affect capitalism let us consider a growing economy, on that is, uh, one that's coming out of a recession. Such a growing economy stimulates demand for, un, uh, for employment as unemployment falls. The costs of finding workers increase, and the wage and condition and demands of existing workers intensify. As the economy is growing and labor is scarce, the threat associated with the hardship of unemployment is weakened. The share of profits is squeezed, and in reaction to this, companies begin to cut costs by reducing inventories, postponing investment plans, and, well, laying off workers. As a result, the economy moves into a downturn. Unemployment rises, wage demands are moderated. Eventually, this enables the share of profits, first of all, to stabilize and then rise. Such an interplay between profits and unemployment as the key determinant of the business cycle is observed in empirical data. Paul Omerod, The Death of Economics, page 188. Thus, an economy approaches full employment, uh, thus, as an economy approaches full employment, the balance of power on the labor market changes. The sack is no longer that great a threat as people see that they can get a job elsewhere. Thus, wages and working conditions increase as companies try to get new and keep existing employees, and output is harder to maintain. 
In the words of economist William Lazenick, labor that is able to command a higher price than previously because of an appearance of a tighter labor market is by definition labor that is highly mobile via the market. And labor that's highly mobile via the market is labor whose supply of effort is difficult for managers to control in the production process. Hence, the advent of tight labor markets generally results in more rapidly rising average costs, as well as upward shifts in the average cost curve. Business Organization and the Myth of the Market Economy, page 106. In other words, under conditions of full employment, employers are in danger of losing the upper hand. Juliet B. Shore, the overworked American, page 75, Shore argues that employers have a structural advantage in the labor market. Because there are typically more candidates ready and willing to endure this work marathon of long, er of long hours than jobs for them to fill, page 71. Thus, the labor market is usually a buyer's market, and so the sellers have to compromise. In the end, workers adapt to this inequality of power, and instead of getting what they want, they get what they get. But under full employment, this changes. In such a situation, it's the bosses who have to start compromising, <clears throat> and they don't like it. As, to, as Shore notes, America has never experienced a sustained period of full employment. The closest we've gotten is in the late 1960s when the overall unemployment rate was under 4% for four years. But that experience does more to prove the point than any other example. The trauma caused to business by those years of a tight labor market was considerable. Since then, there has been a powerful consensus that the nation cannot withstand such a low rate of unemployment. So... In other words, employment is not good for the capitalist system. Do the power of full employment provides workers? Thus, unemployment is a necessary requirement for a successful capitalist economy and not some kind of aberration in an otherwise healthy system. Thus, so-called anarcho-capitalists claim that pure capitalism will soon result in permanent full employment are, well, demonstrably false. Any moves towards full employment will result in a slump as capitalists see their profits squeezed from below by either collective class struggle or by individual mobility in the labor market. This was recognized by individualist anarchists like Benjamin Tucker, who argued that mutual banking would give an unheard of impetus to business and consequently create an unprecedented demand for labor, a demand which would always be in excess of the supply, directly contrary to the present condition of the labor market. The Anarchist Reader, page 149 to 150. In other words, full employment would end capitalist exploitation, drive non-labor income to zero, and ensure the worker the full value of their labor. In other words, end capitalism. Thus, for most, if not all, anarchists, the exploitation of labor is only possible when unemployment exists, and the supply of labor exceeds the demand for it. Any move towards unemployment will result in a profit squeeze and either the end of capitalism or an economic slump. Indeed, as I argued in the last section, the extended periods of approximately full employment until the 1960s had the advantage that any profit squeeze could, in the short run anyway, be passed on to working class people in the shape of, well, inflation. As prices rise, labor is made cheaper, profit margins supported, this option is restricted under a pure capitalism for, again, reasons discussed in the last section. And so pure capitalism will be affected by full, um, full employment faster than impure capitalism. As an economy approaches full employment, new, uh, hiring new workers suddenly becomes more, much more difficult. They're harder to find, cost more, or less experienced. Such shortages are extremely costly for a firm. This encourages a firm to pass on these rises to society in the form of price raises, so creating inflation. Workers, in turn, try to maintain their standard of living. Quote, every, uh, every general increase in labor costs in recent years, note Jay Breach, uh, Brecker and uh, Jay Costell in the late 1970s, has followed rather than preceded an increase in consumer prices. Wage increases have been the result of workers' efforts to catch up after their incomes have already been eroded by inflation, nor could it, be, uh, could it easily be otherwise. All a businessman has to do is raise a price, is to make an announcement. Wage rates are primarily determined by contracts, and so cannot be easily adjusted in the short term. Common Sense for Bad Times, page 120. 
these full employment pressures will still exist with pure capitalism and due to the nature of the banking system will not have the safety value of uh, the safety valve of inflation. This means that periodic profit squeezes will occur due to the nature of a tight labor market and the increased power of workers this generates. This in turn means that a pure capitalism will be subject to periods of unemployment and so still have, again, a business cycle, a boom and a bust. This is usually acknowledged by right libertarians, at least in passing, although they seem to think that this is purely a short-term problem. It seems a strange short-term problem that continually occurs, but again, logic, empiricism, right-wing libertarians. But such an analysis is denied by right libertarians, usually. For them, government action combined with the habit of many labor unions to obtain higher, uh, higher than market wages rates for, the, uh, for their members creates an exacerbated mass unemployment. This flows from the deductive logic of much capitalist economics. The basic assumption of capitalism is, uh, capitalism is that market's clear. So if unemployment exists, then it can only be because of the price of labor wages is too high. Austrian uh, economist W. Duncan Rieke argues that unemployment will disappear provided real wages are not artificially high. Markets, Entrepreneurs, and Liberty, page 72. Thus, the assumption provokes the conclusion. Unemployment is caused by an unclearing market as markets always clear. And the cause for this is either the state or the unions. But what if the labor market cannot clear without seriously damaging the power and profits of capitalism? What if unemployment is required to maximize profits by weakening labor's bargaining position on the market and so maximizing capitalist power? In that case, unemployment is caused by capitalism, not by forces external to it. However, Let's, let us assume that the right libertarian theory is correct. It's not, but let's try it. Let's assume that unemployment is all the fault of the selfish unions and that a job seeker who does not want to wait will always get a job in the unhampered market economy. This is von Mises' quote, by the way, Human Action, page 595. Would crushing the unions reduce unemployment? Let us assume that unions have been crushed and the government has been abolished, or at the, least the very le at the very least become a minimum state. Think minarchist. The aim of the capitalist class is to maximize their profits, and to do this, they invest in labor-saving machinery and otherwise attempt to increase productivity. But increasing productivity means that prices of goods fall, and falling prices mean increasing real wages. It's it's high real wages that, according to real libertarians, that cause unemployment. So as a reward for increasing productivity, workers will have to have their money wages cut in order to stop unemployment from occurring. For this reason, some employers might refrain from cutting wages in order to, damage, uh, to avoid damage to morale, potentially an important concern, I suppose. Moreover, wage contracts involve time. A contract will usually agree a certain wage for a certain period. This builds in rigidity into the market. Wages cannot be adjusted as quickly as commodity prices. Of course, it could be argued that reducing the period of the contract and or allowing the wage to be adjusted could overcome this problem. However, if we reduce the period of the contract the workers are at at a suffer, um, uh, are at a suffering dis, uh, that, uh, that they are at a suffered uh, they suffer a disadvantage as they will not know if they have a job tomorrow and so they'll not be able to easily plan for their future, an evil situation for anyone to be in, see zero hour contracts in the UK. Moreover, even without formal contracts, wage renegotiation renegotiation can be expensive. After all, it takes time to bargain and time is money under capitalism. And wage cutting can involve the risk of loss of mutual good between employer and employee. And would you give your boss the power to adjust your wages as they thought were necessary? To do so would imply an altruistic trust in others not to abuse their power. Thus, a pure capitalism would be constantly seeing employment increase and decrease as productivity levels change. There exists important reasons why the labor market need not clear, which revolve around the avoidance and delaying of wage cuts by the actions of capitalists themselves. Thus, given a choice between cutting wages for all workers and laying off some workers without cutting the wages of remaining employees, it's unsurprising that capitalists usually just go for the latter. After all, the sack is an important disciplining device, and firing workers can make the remaining employees more inclined to work harder and, well, be more obedient. And of course, many employers are not inclined to hire overqualified workers. This is because once the economy picks up again, 
that worker has a tendency to move on elsewhere, and so it can cost them time and money finding a replacement and training them. This means that inv involuntary employment can easily occur, so reducing tendencies towards full employment even more. In addition, one of the assumptions of the standard marginalist economic model is one of decreasing returns to scale. This means that as, un as employment increases, costs rise, and so prices also rise, and so real wages fall. But in reality, many industries have increasing returns to scale, which means that as production un increase unit cost falls, prices fall, and so real wages rise. Thus, in an economy, unemployment would simply in, uh, would increase simply because of the nature of the production process. A cut in money wages is not a neutral act. A cut in money wages means a reduction in demand for certain industries, which may have to reduce the wages of its employees or fire them outright to make ends meet. This could produce a, an accumulative effect and actually increase unemployment rather than end up reducing it. In addition, there are no self-correcting forces at work in the labor market, which will quickly bring employment back to full levels. This is for a few reasons. Firstly, the supply of labor cannot be reduced by cutting back production as in other markets. All we can do is move to other areas and hope to find work there. Secondly, the supply of labor can sometimes adjust to wage decreases in the wrong direction. Low wages might drive workers to offer a greater amount of labor, i.e. Longer, longer hours, to make up for any shortfall or to keep their job. This is usually termed the efficiency wage effect. Similarly, um, other family members may seek, un, uh, may seek employment in order to maintain a given, lever, uh, given standard of living. Falling wages may cause a number of workers seeking employment to, uh, seeking employment to increase, causing a, fur uh, a further fall in wages, and so on. This is ignoring the effects of lowering wages on demand. All right. The, the paradox of, piece, uh, of piecework is an important example of this effect. As Shore argues, piece rate workers are caught in a vicious downward spiral of poverty and overwork. When rates were low, they found themselves compel uh, compelled to make up an extra output what they were losing on each piece. But the extra output produced the glutted market and drove rates down further. Juliet C. Shore, The Overworked American, page 58. Thus, in the face of reducing wages, the labor market may see a cumulative move away from rather than towards full, uh, full employment. The right libertarian argument is that unemployment is caused by real wages being too high, which in turn flows from the assumption that markets clear. If there is unemployment, then the price of the commodity labor is too high, otherwise supply and demand would meet and the markets would clear. But if, I, as I argued above, unemployment is essential to disciplined workers, then the labor market cannot clear except for short periods. And if the labor market clears, profits are squeezed. Thus, the claim that unemployment is caused by too high real wages is false. And any cutting these, of these wages will result in deepening any slump, making recovery longer to come about. In other words, the, function, uh, the assumption that the labor market must clear is false, as is any assumption that reducing wages will tend to push the economy quickly back to full employment. The nature of wage labor and the commodity being sold, i.e. human labor time liberty, ensure that it can never be the same as others. This has important implications for economic theory and the claims of right libertarian implications that they fail to see due to their vision of labor as a commodity like any other. The question arises, of course, of whether during periods of full employment, workers could not take advantage of their market power and gain increased worker controls, create cooperatives, and so reform away capitalism. This was the argument of the mutualist individualist argument, uh, anarchists, and it does have merits. However, it is clear that bosses hate to have their authority reduced and so combat workers' control whenever and wherever they can. The logic is simple. If workers increase their control within the workplace, the manager and bosses may soon be out of a job, and more importantly, they may start to control the allocations of profits. Any increase in working class militancy may provoke capitalists to stop or reduce investment and credit and so create the economic environment, i.e. increasing unemployment, necessary to undercut that working class power. In other words, a period of full unemployment is not sufficient to reform capitalism away. 
full employment, never mind any struggles over workers' controls, will reduce profits. And if profits are reduced, then firms find it hard to repay debts, fund investment, and provide profits for shareholders. This profit squeeze would be enough to force capitalism into a slump, and any attempt to gain worker self-management in periods of high employment will help push it over the edge. After all, workers' control without control over the allocation of any surplus is, well, phony. Moreover, if we ignore the effects of full employment may not last due to problems associated with overinvestment, credit and interest rate problems, see section one of this chapter, and realization and aggregate demand, uh, demand disjoints. Full employment adds to the problems associated with the capitalist business cycle. And so if class struggle and worker power did not exist or cost problems, capitalism still would not be stable. If equilibrium is a myth, then so is full employment. It seems somewhat, uh, somewhat ironic that so-called anarcho-capitalists and other right libertarians maintain that there will be equilibrium, full employment, in one market within capitalism it can never actually exist in. This is usually quietly acknowledged by most right libertarians who mention in passing that some temporary unemployment will exist in their system, but temporary unemployment is not full employment. Of course, you could maintain that all unemployment is voluntary and get around the problem by denying it outright, but, you know, that's not going to get us very far. So, it's all fine and well saying that libertarian capitalism would be based upon the maxim from each as they choose to each as they are chosen. Robert Nozick, Anarchy, State, and Utopia, page 160. But if the labor market is such that workers have little option about what they choose to give and fear that they will not be chosen, then they're at a disadvantage when compared to their bosses and so consent to being treated as a resource from the capitalists can make a profit from. And so... This will result in any free contract on the labor market favoring one party at the expense of the other, as can be seen from actually existing capitalism. Thus, any free exchange on the labor market will not usually reflect the true desires of working people and who will make all the adjusting and end up wanting what they get. Only when the economy is approaching full employment will the labor market start to reflect the true desires of working people and their wage start to approach its full product. When this happens, profits are squeezed and capitalism goes into a slump and the resulting unemployment disciplines the working class and restores profit margins. Thus, Full employment will be the exception rather than the rule within capitalism, and that is a conclusion with which the historical record indicates. In other words, in a normally working capitalist economy, any labor contracts will not create relationships based upon freedom due to the inequalities in power between workers and capitalists. Instead, any contracts will, based upon, uh, will be based upon domination, not freedom, which prompts the question, how is libertarian capitalism libertarian if it erodes the liberty of a large class of people? <laughs>